you mentioned Thebes, and I don't think I've ever told you this, but I spent a year as a teacher of English in Thebes. Wow. And um, one thing which your book um, reminded me is that the, <laughs> the modern city sits on top of yeah, the ancient yeah. city. And so my question is, what kind of questions do you think, if one were able to remove the modern city, might be contained within the archaeological, archaeological yeah. treasure trove that is ancient Thebes? It's a very tough one because, of course, the Athenians, who were their nearest major neighbours, um, referred to them as Boeotian pigs. I mean, it's an old joke. But Pindar, famous um, lyric poet, so celebrating victories at the great games, especially the Olympics, was of a Theban. And he actually refers in one of his poems to this slur. So, I mean, you might imagine that actually, as with Sparta, yes, Thebes has temples and so on so but it's not got a particularly distinguished visual art record and uh, it's produced a couple of great poets uh, Pindar one of them but um, the man that I'm most fond of that it produced is a guy called Epaminondas now what archaeologically what might one hope yes some um, more graves I mean it's an awful thing but archaeologists actually learn um, most about ancient life from studying um, people in death, partly because of the grave goods, partly now because we analyse um, bones and so you can talk about diet and health and longevity and that sort of thing. But um, partly because um, the attitude to death tells you quite a lot about uh, people's attitude to life and no Greek community was anything like um, the Egyptians. They simply did not have that fascination or awful preoccupation with life after death. They had a relatively um, untroubled or relatively light touch notion to what happened. Yes, there was a hell. Yes, it's better not to go to hell. But they're not constantly living with the thought of death uh, around them. So one would learn quite a lot about Theban um, everyday life from cemeteries, which we don't have. And about sanctuaries, I don't think we'd learn anything more than we already know from the ones around in the countryside. And what um, is very interesting about them is that they developed federal politics, whereas Athens is one city with lots of subordinate villages. The Thebans are a city, but they're part of a federation of the ocean cities, which they, of course, dominated. They had the best land and they're the most aggressive or the most developed. And they developed within federalism, first a kind of oligarchy and then a kind of democracy. So they offer an alternative model to how Greeks get on with each other. Um, the normal model is antagonism and um, keeping apart, and yes, some imitation, some competitive emulation, but not much in the way of cooperation, whereas the Boeotians actually formed a unified federal state, which is an interesting phenomenon. You write in the conclusion, Paul, about the Greeks in many ways being alien and an exemplification of the other. And so I wanted, in, in conclusion, why you think it matters to, to study them in such detail and understand their civilization. Yes, I think that's a very good question. The problem for us is, I think actually, the Victorians are other. So it's not that the Greeks are odd in that they're not us. But what's odd is that so much of our vocabulary, so much especially of our political vocabulary, so much of our everyday notion, theatre, drama, these are all Greek words and so on. So in other words, we in one sense tend to think of them as quite familiar. But then if you put back in everything that's odd, in particular to start with just two phenomena, religion and slavery, polytheism as opposed to monotheism, gods are everywhere. There are lots of different sorts of supernatural powers that it is worth worshipping in some sense. And yet within the framework that's so alien, they produce theatre which is not so alien to our way of thinking. And it's that juxtaposition, that um, side by side um, evolution that, that, that I find constantly puzzling. Slavery, well now many, many other cultures have had unfree people and slaves and so on. But what seems to be distinctive, and it's the other side of the evolution of a 
very autonomous, very empowered political person, that is the citizen. Well, the other side of it is the total disempowerment of a human being and the reduction of either men or women to the status of things. And apparently, so far as I'm aware, there had not been anywhere in the world before the Greeks in the 6th century BC this category of unperson, this depersonalized um, sort of un free person. Lots of categories of unfreedom. Sparta has another one where they don't go to the step of creating a wholly owned um, chattel. So uh, <laughs> whether that's uh, admirable, I think it probably isn't, but it's actually part, it's a condition of the achievement of the other side of it, which is the uh, wholly independent, uh, fully formed independent uh, political person, the citizen. Paul Cartledge. His Ancient Greece, A History in Eleven Cities, is currently available in hardback. You can find out more about his book, and several million others, by going to blackwell.co.uk. Thank you for listening to this special classics podcast from Blackwells, and until next time, goodbye.